Welcome and thank you for joining us at this STS video roundtable. Today we're going to be discussing stenting, bypass, and or lifestyle changes for the treatment of severe but stable ischemic heart disease. I'm uh, Tom McGilvery from Houston and I am pleased to be with a very distinguished group of cardiac surgeons from around the country and around North America. And uh, I'd like to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Uh, sure. I'm Joe Sabic from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Mark Well from Ottawa, Canada. Jennifer Lawton from Baltimore, Maryland. John Puskas from New York. So as we all know, ischemic heart disease is still the number one killer, not only in North America, but around the world. And I'd say in the last decade, there's been a lot of work and recently a fair amount of press about what's the appropriate treatment for patients with ischemic heart disease. The ischemia trial, which is the largest trial on a stable ischemic heart disease was just presented but not reported. And maybe Mark, could you give us an update on that? Sure. Ischemia is a very interesting trial. It's really an out-of-the-box approach to try to treat patients who do not have left main coronary artery disease and based on their imaging burden of ischemia, if you will, according to a conservative strategy, which is essentially medical therapy that's optimized as much as possible versus an invasive strategy that involves an angiogram. And then depending on the results of the angiogram, the patient will have some form of revascularization, which was performed the vast majority of those patients. So many thought that ischemia would not be a trial of great relevance to surgeons, but I would argue that it is. As you said, Tom, it's not published yet. So everything we say at this point is still somewhat speculative. But there are some very interesting numbers which I think surgeons should know about because the overall message has been that there's no benefit from the invasive over the conservative strategy. I think there are caveats to that. And I'll tell you why. 41% of patients in ischemia were diabetics. About 49, 47% or so had triple vessel coronary artery disease and another 29% had double vessel coronary artery disease. So, I don't know what the proportion is of patients who had diabetes with multivessel disease or triple vessel disease on their own, but I can tell you almost certainly that it was a vast majority of patients who had this. Yet, only a quarter of patients had bypass surgery. These were RCT study patients, so they were stable, they were relatively semi-urgent or semi-elective, whatever way you want to look at it. These were not patients who were falling off the cliff, right? They were suitable for randomization. So, my take with ischemia is that, of course, being provisional on seeing the final paper, is that I don't think patients in the invasive group were treated according to class one recommendations. And with my cardiology colleagues, with the interventional cardiologists, I say, this is bad for you guys, it's bad for us as well, because it was again a situation of underutilization of cabbage, overutilization of PCI, which makes both PCI and cabbage look bad in the invasive group, regressing it towards a mean which is essentially the results of the conservative strategy. So John, how do you think this will, or how do you think it should change how we treat patients with stable ischemic heart disease? I think it's going to actually have a relatively minor impact. And the reason is because these patients were very highly selected. It took a long time to recruit the desired number of patients. In fact, they truncated it quite early, uh, giving up on recruit, recruiting the initial uh, intended number. Uh, the patients were uh, obliged to have almost no symptoms, remarkably few symptoms to get into this trial. So there are, this is an unusual group of patients with a substantial ischemic burden and remarkably few symptoms. Anyone with accelerating angina or rest angina was completely excluded. Many, many patients had no angina at all and a large group had only occasional angina once a month sort of thing. So they're not the typical patients referred to us. There were no urgent or emergent cases of any kind. These are truly ambulatory stable patients that were randomized. Um, Mark's point that, two, that three quarters of the patients in the invasive group who, were in, who had revascularization received PCI, and that's, that's correct, um, which is probably not appropriate. Uh, so this is really not a trial of cabbage versus optimal medical therapy for stable coronary disease. This is a trial of PCI versus opt optimal medical therapy for stable coronary disease. And as we know, PCI does not prolong life in that scenario. It has not in any of the numerous previous trials that have compared uh, those two uh, modalities in that similar patient population. Uh, 
So I, in that regard, it's not news. Um, it did appear that those patients in the invasive group had better relief of angina, substantially better relief of angina, especially if they had three vessel versus one vessel disease. So there are some interventionists who are saying this is a wonderful trial. We finally showed that PCI can, can uh, reduce angina. Um, and I guess that's one way of spinning it. Um, I, I would suspect that the lack of a mortality benefit, and there is none in this trial, in that group of patients, uh, probably relates to the fact that PCI has never shown a mortality benefit over optimal medical therapy. And the vast majority of invasively treated patients were treated with PCI, not with cabbage. Well, but, uh, so Jennifer, I mean, where you look in the time point of how people do with coronary artery disease, medical therapy, uh, interventional therapy, or cabbage, depending upon where you take that snapshot, the message from the movie will change. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I agree. Um, the message will change, and and uh, and I would like to wait for the article to be published to be able to read it to make further comments. But they do say that the the lines cross at two years, and with the mean follow up about three and a half years, we don't really see the benefit of bypass surgery compared to medical therapy or PCI. And the other thing about this trial is these patients all had normal left ventricular ejection fractions. They were healthy patients, otherwise, and they were taking optimal medical therapy and the majority of a lot of the patients that we see every day are not able to pay for their medicines, take them reliably, and maintain normal blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar. So it would be important to maybe look at some subgroup analyses when we see the final data. I do think that is a good point, that, that the medical therapy was very much indeed optimized. And so I think if there is a winner in the ischemia trial, is that medical, medical therapy, therapy. Is, yeah. is, is effective. Where does the role of, a, of the heart team, Joe, fit into all of this? How should the ischemia trial come to, what, what message should that go to the heart team? You know, I have a, a difficult time answering that question because I kind of uh, agree a lot with what uh, John said. You know, I don't think these are the patients that we see who are undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting today. Most of the patients are in the hospital, they've either had an acute coronary syndrome or they have unstable angina. The patients that we see who have stable angina who are undergoing surgery, you know, tend have been extensively worked up, including a coronary angiogram. And we know that when we think about survival benefit, there are certain angiographic subgroups that surgery really benefits you know, triple vessel disease with decreased left ventricular function or single or double vessel disease with proximal LAD involvement. I think when we look at the anatomy in the ischemia group, it's pretty low. It was defined by CT and it was a 50% lesion, which we know to develop ischemia you need 70% lesions. So I'm not sure how the heart team even looks at this group of patients unless as surgeons we're going to look at people who are just very mildly symptomatic with disease that surgery doesn't benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I have a hard time answering that, uh, that, that question because these seem to me, again, the paper is going to be important where we can really analyze it, but when I've had a chance to review these slides, these patients are very low risk. And if we look at the total population of patients who were supposed to have intervention, 20% didn't because on angiography, they didn't have significant coronary artery disease, which I think points to some of the problems with the evaluation of the patients in ischemia. Did they really have coronary disease? At least 20% of them didn't seem to uh, that were significant. This, this may be a reflection on the imperfections of present day CT angiogram of the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it's a tough technology. The physics are hard. You've got a moving target that's two millimeters wide and you're trying to make high resolution images of it. That's tough. And I think that Joe's point's well taken. A lot of, 20% of the patients who were supposed to have an intervention didn't. Right. Uh, presumably because they got around, did an angiogram and had a look and said, you know, there's really nothing to stand here. The converse of that is also true. A number of patients that were randomized into the non-invasive limb ended up having an intervention over time. Right. So, right. you know, in contemporary practice, many places, somebody comes in and they get a positive stress test of some kind, and then they're rushed through the system to get revascularized. So, Mark, how do you think this will change that practice? Yeah, I, I think that last point you made is an important one, but 
I don't think it's a critical one, as long as the proportion is relatively small and finite. Right? Uh, I think patients are willing to accept that you know, they may start with medical therapy in need, we've asked later. I think to complete uh, and to add on to Joe's comment, I think the implications for the medical therapy or the heart team team uh, is that we need medical therapy experts. Uh, and uh, I would say even at my own institution, when we sit down and review angiograms as a heart team, we don't have a really top medical therapy person to bring that point of view. And I think after ischemia, that point of view is increasingly relevant. And I think many heart teams will now advocate to have this extra person or extra capacity as part of the heart team because there's, there's already something to be said around the importance of medical therapy and the role even in patients who we always have the reflex as surgeons, interventional cardiologists, to think that they absolutely automatically require revascularization. And I think ischemia opens the door to maybe that's not always true. So Jennifer, Joe had pointed out, you know, we have these guidelines based on anatomy uh, for what the appropriate intervention is. And there's a considerable overlap. So do you think the ischemia trial impacts that at all or should impact that at all? Well, that's a loaded question, <laughs> um, but I, I think it depends on the timing of when the manuscript comes out. We don't really understand which patients that crossed over were, or that was an intention to treat. Was it the as treated, and you know how, what were the outcomes? So, you know, the it is a randomized trial, but will it rise to the level of changing a recommendation? That will have to be determined. I do think it, I think there was not much focus on treatment based on anatomy, other than having the enough anatomy to get into the trial. Uh, th that was sort of the, the point of my question. Mm -hmm. you know, I th Randomized trials have bias at the point of entry into the trial. Mm -hmm. And I think that their generalizability depends on a, on a careful examination of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. When was the last time we as surgeons saw a group of patients with an average EF of 60%, six zero, and a third of whom had no symptoms. And none of them had unstable angina and none had left main. This is not a surgical referral pattern. Those, those patients in that trial were not the cases that we, we typically operate on. In fact, I asked, a very aggressive, exceedingly skilled interventionist named Samin Sharma mm -hmm. at, at Mount Sinai Hospital. What portion of patients that you're stenting now would have, would have been eligible to, for enrollment in the ischemia trial? And he actually paused, he did some study, came back, he said about 15%. I think that's a, a great point because what John is talking about is equipoise. And um, you know, there have been studies that have looked at patients who have been randomized and then registry studies where the physicians decided how the patient was treated, were, were treated and shown that in the registries where the physician-directed therapy was, those patients did better than those in the randomized trial. I think to get into ischemia, the cardiologists had to really believe in their mind that there might not be any benefit of intervention to start with right. or surgery to start with, and that's why there were equipoise. These were so low risk. Again, I, I think these are patients we don't see. So the COURAGE trial um, about 12 years ago reported, I mean, it was a similar but not the same. What do you think, Mark? I mean, that didn't seem to change practice very much. I mean, the, the anatomy was defined. There was, it was essentially PCI versus medical therapy. Uh, again, to John and Joe's points, the ejection fraction was normal. These were fairly well-selected patients. But I would say we have to be careful by saying that, you know, the entry criteria, most people who will interpret the trial are not fully aware. And I would say overgeneralization of the findings of a trial is something that we do every day, mm -hmm. every single one of us. We, and, and unfortunately, what I like to stress is that with ischemia, you know, there's probably a significant proportion of patients who would have had a benefit with regards to MI freedom. So a diabetic, for instance, with multivessel disease, that's a twofold benefit. With regards to mortality, it's a 50%, 38 to 50% benefit. And for triple vessel disease patient, the same, right? So, so I think we have to wait for the paper, but it's important, I think, to understand that in the invasive strategy group, the patients were probably left to whatever reflects what's happening in the global kind of underutilization of the cabbage type of scenario. So, so at the risk of treading into deep water, so 
those patients that do have disease that can be treated by intervention or cabbage, how do you put that into perspective with this trial? Now, this trial really didn't address that point. Yeah. This is not a cabbage versus PCI trial. This is actually a CT angiogram versus a coronary angiogram trial in, in many ways. The entry point is after a CTA, and the decision tree is to get a cath or not get a cath. If you don't get a cath, you're not getting invasive therapy. If you do get a cath, you may get invasive therapy. It will then be at the discretion of the local operators, whether that's a PCI or a cabbage. So this is actually, I think, we, comparisons between PCI and cabbage outcomes in this trial will be hypothesis generating only. I mean, do you think that this could potentially, patients that get referred and get a coronary CTA, that somebody in advance of the interventional cardiologist will make the decision as to what happens next? Oh, I think so. Probably. I think yeah. that's happening already today yeah. when yeah. you're looking at calcium scores. I mean, there, there are many facilities that will do just uh, calcium scoring, and if it's over a certain number, you know, they will then decide, what, or under a certain number, decide whether the patient should go on to angiography and, and done by clinical cardiologists, absolutely. I think your point is very well taken. This is something that's been hypothesized by many clinicians and even around the presentation of the ischemia trial at the scientific sessions. The, the, the thought is, well, do we even need nuclear perfusion imaging? Essentially, you have a patient X coming in rule out left main by way of CT angiogram and give them maximum medical therapy. And that's essentially what the hypothesis of, of ischemia supports. My problem in what I'm trying to point out is that I think that the comparator in the evasive group was not treated according to guidelines, therefore regressing towards the mean and allowing this non-different outcome between the two groups. But, so Jennifer, the, one of the things that was interesting I, in the data that I saw that the degree of ischemia on the stress test didn't seem to correlate with what happened to those patients that were in the, in the non-intervention arm. So does that change, in your opinion, what, whether we should be getting those stress tests or paying much attention to them? That's a good question. I mean, we can have a positive stress test or a negative stress test and have either outcome. I mean, we've all operated on many patients that have a normal mm -hmm. stress test. Um, if they have global ischemia, multivessel disease, they can have a normal stress test. So that's a difficult question. I don't know the answer. Lots of questions and not necessarily clear answers for this very difficult problem. Well, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for joining us today. And uh, for all of you watching, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, please tune in to more uh, STS Roundtable discussions.